morning. And um, before we get started, just a couple of announcements. Dave, we wanted to make an announcement. I did? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> At least you told me you did. <laughs> At the worship service, we will be going to the community building for potluck. If you don't know where the community building is, just fall in line and follow the traffic. <laughs> We've got plenty of food. If you didn't fix anything, don't be embarrassed to come because we can feed you. If God could multiply fish and bread, we can modify. Er, <laughs> you multiply this. He, he, he will make sure we're fed. <laughs> So, uh, look forward to seeing all of you there. And uh, time of fellowship, like I said at the end of Sunday school, if you have questions for John, Amanda, or Andrew, that's going to be taken care of over there also. Just enjoy the day together with it, all of our like-minded believers. And, yes, Betty. Yeah. Just a quick announcement, there is a free Christian concert at the city this evening, uh, no free, more importantly, Christian concert uh, at the, the city tonight, the doors open at 6.30. And just a reminder, next Sunday is our business meeting um, right after church, no potluck, right after church here. So if you have reports, make sure that you have those ready for the business meeting next Sunday. And for our guests from First Baptist, any of you, if you have a problem hearing, Dan has hearing devices back there to help um, if you have a hard time hearing the service. So you can see Dan in the back if you need a hearing device. Well, we, we uh, appreciate every opportunity we have to jointly gather, um, being so close to one another. And I was thinking this week about, uh, throughout the New Testament, uh, the churches of what they would have called the diaspora, which means the scattered churches. And uh, there are periods in that time where we see that they connect with each other. Um, they, they share resources together, but the reality is, is that they share the same common confession that we uh, proclaim this morning, that, um, that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he came to this to be God with us, that he lived, he suffered, he died, yet he was resurrected, that we may have hope. Even when our lives are darkened, our common confession this morning is we have hope because of Jesus. As we celebrate together this morning, we do welcome the good family, um, uh, missionaries to Hungary, in Hungary, with Hungary. Um, and uh, um, uh, they serve with international ministries, which are part of the American Baptist Churches of uh, the United States. So um, we welcome you this morning and we look forward to uh, hearing the word that God has placed on your heart and the work that you're doing there. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Christians join to sing.
mother, um, Ina, passed away. Ina was 97. And uh, her funeral is Tuesday. The visitation starts at 11. Uh, the funeral is at 1 o'clock at Hamish Docks. Okay. So we can remember Sharon and her family. Amen. Josh, uh, yesterday we had a time of gathering at the funeral home. Uh, to help uphold the Daniel family. And it was a good time. We got to see a, a lot of Mary's children that we hadn't seen for a long time. Missed her, she said, while well, I was there. <laughs> but she was hiding in the back. And then some of you may know, uh, I always called him Pinky Show. His first name was Julius. And I don't blame him for wanting to be called Pinky. <laughs> but uh, he passed away also uh, in the community. So I remember him. We're happy to have our granddaughter, Zoe Bumgarner, with us today. She lives in Crawfordsville, so she's here for a little um, visitation with her family. And she wants to come to church with us this morning. So. With regards to the furnaces at the First Baptist Church, I had a contractor presently at my house, and I informed him, I asked him if he could help us out and recommend somebody to do the repair work, and I guess he's had a real soft spot in this art for churches. He's really helping us out in terms of cost. So $25,000 down to half that cost, so just, I mean, I think more works in many ways. Amen. Josh, I have a prayer or praise, and I would ask you and Bethany to come down and John and Amanda to come over. Oh. Where's Bethany? She's she's over there. Oh, she's she's over there. there. She was playing. I thought, man, she must really be mad at you. <laughs> Most of the time. <laughs> Many of you don't realize, uh, unless you hear it, that October has been designated as Minister Appreciation. <coughs> John, Amanda, we appreciate you, the Thank work you're you. doing. Amen. Thank you. To take the time to come to this church out in the middle of the swamp. <laughs> and, that. and Josh, I was thinking, the end of this year, You've completed six years of interim ministry here, yeah. and how you've involved yourself in the church and, and, and that. And I appreciate it, especially, and I know others do too. So, on behalf of the church, Aww. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For each one of you. And that's really for. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. That's a blessing, you guys. Thank you. Um, you know, you try not to embarrass, oh, I shut myself off. Um, you try not to embarrass people, but I, I do want to say it, it really is wonderful. There is another pastor in our midst, uh, uh, Pastor Mike. It is wonderful to see you today. <laughs> All of us in, in, at both First Baptist as well as Mill Creek, you know, we know your struggle. We don't know it personally, we, but uh, um, we do pray for you regularly uh, as you continue to heal and that the doctors will one of these days finally say, you know what, Mike, we don't want to see you again. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, we, uh, as we continue, we also celebrate Mike and the years that he provided there at uh, First Baptist of La Porte. Uh, thank you very much. So, other things this morning, uh, big and small, you know, it, it, nothing's out of the realm to say thank you for. You know, you can even say, we can say things like thank you that the Maize and Blue are doing so well this year. Because I know <laughs> all of you are Michigan fans. <laughs> you, know, you, you, you can say that, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, 
let's let's pause. Let's let's give ourselves in a moment of silence here, and I'll close this in just. Lord, we call on your name this morning and recognize you for the, the great and the small. For our confession this morning is, is that all things have begun in your hands. From the creation of time when you spoke uh, the world into existence. You spoke those words that said, I love to create and I want to be with my people. And you gave yourself time and time again, even in the midst of the times where our hearts and our lives have not been uh, focused on you, focused on your kingdom, focused on the things that you desire. And Lord, we are not afraid to lay before you today those unwholesome places, those places uh, that need to be set aside that you might grow and be greater in our lives, that your kingdom might work itself through us. Those places of weakness, even, Lord, in our lives where you say, I can use that, and the world will see how strong you and I are. Lord, we surrender to you our sins, those unwholesome places, and pray that you would see us through the eyes of your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness. That today, Lord, is a day of resurrection and a day of hope, that you lift us up yet again, that we may stand and proclaim your goodness in all things. Lord, thank you for the things and the gifts you have given us. And we pray this morning for the gift of healing healing from surgeries, but healing also from the grief that weighs in our lives because um, someone dear to us is no longer near us. Lord, I pray that you would be a God of life today, a God that breathes your spirit upon us, that calls us once again to be a people of hope, a people of encouragement, a people of goodness. That you might prepare our hearts to go into the world to places that we have not yet been sent, into the lives of people who may not have encountered us before. That the work you're doing in their life and the calling that you're doing in ours might come together and we might lift up the goodness of our confession that Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord, we come and we surrender our lives to you today. We pray that you might be our God and we give our lives to be your people. In all these things we pray and all God's people said, Amen, Amen and may it be so. I want to invite us as we stand and sing the words of the doxology today, giving him thanks for the things he's given to us. Praise God.
once again give you thanks for all gifts that you have given us. We pray that you will take these tithes, these gifts, and these offerings, and that you would use them to bless the world around us, that they might know the power of the confession, Jesus Christ is Lord. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. You, you may be seated. If you'd like to turn to Isaiah chapter 25, you are welcome to do so. Um, I'll be reading verses 1 through 9. If not, I ask that you would um, center your hearts and your ears to hear and receive the word from the prophet Isaiah. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name, for in perfect faithfulness you have done marvelous things, things that were planned long ago. You have made a city a heap of rubble, the fortified town a ruin, the foreigner's stronghold a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will honor you. Cities of ruthless nations will revere you. You have been a refuge for the poor, a refuge for the needy in his distress, a shelter from the storm and a shade from the heat. For the breath of the ruthless is like a storm driving against a wall and like the heat of the desert. You silence the uproar of foreigners. As heat is reduced by the shadow of a cloud, so the song of the ruthless is still. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. And on this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. And in that day they will say, Surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word.
stand and sing page 636, I Must Tell Jesus.
Morning Church, it is such a great, great joy to be with you today. We bring you, uh, again, greetings from International Ministries on behalf of the American Baptist um, or Mission Society, also from the Hungarian Baptist Churches and from the International Baptist Church in Debrecen. We're so happy to be with you today. We're so thankful to celebrate ministry that we've done together as you, Mill Creek Baptist Church, and hello, First Baptist support. we're glad you're here too. But as Mill Creek Baptist, you have been our ministry partner since 2016, our very first partner congregation. We're so thankful for you. Um, we want to also introduce you, if you haven't met them yet, um, to our family. Um, but first, uh, we do serve in the country of Hungary, and uh, that's our city, Debrecen, there. Sorry, Andrew. I think our family's in the next one just after that. Thank you, ma'am. This is our son, Andrew. He's 14 years old, and uh, he's uh, normally in school in Hungary. Uh, but uh, this year, while we are on U.S. assignment, he's um, doing a lot of wonderful things, including helping out his mom and dad, who need a lot of help with tech. So we're really thankful that he's here. Um, we also have, we have four children. Our younger two daughters, Elizabeth in the black and Sarah in the blue, are in Hungary right now. They're 18 and 20, and they are students at the University of Debrecen. And this is our daughter, Rachel, and our son-in-law, Blake. And uh, Rachel also graduated from the University of Debrecen, but she met Blake uh, during COVID at Green Lake Conference Center while they were on summer staff, and they fell in love and got married, and we are so blessed to have a wonderful family. Um, the Apostle Paul says in the book of Philippians, in all my prayers for all of you, I pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And that's how we work as American Baptist missionaries. We partner with local congregations both here and in uh, the mission field, in our case in Hungary. Our call to mission came a few years ago. John was an American Baptist pastor for 18 years, most recently serving outside of Detroit, Michigan. And I was a public school teacher for about that amount of time. And we were living what you might call the uh, American dream, the pastor-teacher version. Um, in our case, we would call it the goods life, because our last name is good. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. <laughs> but then something happened that changed everything. So it started with a sabbatical. We were granted the opportunity to take sabbatical, and in that time, we received a grant from the League the Lilly Pharmaceutical Company Endowment, uh, which enabled us to travel uh, to Europe, to the Republic of Georgia, where we spent six weeks. And God really opened our eyes in that opportunity. Uh, we had always, in our church family, did a project, a mission project called Operation Christmas Child. I don't know if you're familiar with that here, so I see some nods. So we have done that because I think it's a great mission. Uh, especially for children, because uh, we would often take our kids to the store and we would give them some money and they would go in and they would buy a gift for a seven-year-old girl or an eight-year-old boy or whatever the, the particular child was. And then they would bring the gift and we would help them pack it into the box. And sometimes when they got something they really liked, they didn't want to put it in the box, <laughs> which was precisely the point in teaching mission and generosity to children. So when we arrived in the Republic of Georgia, we saw that these churches had received shoeboxes. And I said to the kids, look, kids, maybe a shoebox ended up in a place like this. Well, little did we know, a few weeks later, as we traveled throughout the country of Georgia, that we would actually discover a shoebox. So we met a tour guide, his name was David, and he toured, uh, gave us a tour, and took us to his home, and we stayed with his family, and we met his niece, a little girl by the name of Sopo. She was nine years old, the same age as my youngest daughter, Elizabeth, and she spoke English. And so they instantly became friends with, with my children, and, and they got to play together, and then and my children got to see how she lived, and they were surprised. 
uh, they realized that she didn't have a lot of things like they did as kids. And, and they noticed that this little girl had received a shoebox in her room. And, and they noticed that there was a box of Crayola markers and a squirt gun and a stuffed animal. And they said to me, Dad, I think that's the shoebox we packed last year. <laughs> Wow, I thought, what are the chances? There are no chances that could happen. But I believe what the Bible says. With God, all things are possible. It was a cruel moment. But the most touching thing happened a week later when we were leaving the country of Georgia and this little girl had prepared gifts for my children. And she'd sent them to us with her, her uncle taking us to the airport. And we couldn't fit them in our bags because, you know, you weigh things and it's everything is like, you know, 50 pounds or whatever. And so we shoved things until we got back to the States and we realized that this little girl had given my children gifts from that shoebox. She had taken the pack of Crayola markers and divided them. Each of my kids received two of them. They, they, she gave this work on and the stuffed animal. And we were so moved that this little girl who had so little would give to my children who had virtually everything. And, and we, we believe that when God touches your heart in that way, you are not free to remain the same. And so we felt that we too should offer generously back to the Lord. And, and that was our call to international mission. And so we, we left our, our jobs and, and sold our home in Michigan and began to discover where in the world the Lord was sending us. And as we worked with international ministries, we learned about this little country in Eastern Europe called Hungary. Hungary is about the size geographically of Indiana, so imagine that. And we learned that Hungary has a long history of occupation and oppression. The next picture shows us standing in front of a symbolic iron curtain. I don't know if you remember, but under communism, this was a, a symbolic way that those countries that were cut off from the rest of the world under Soviet influence and occupation were considered behind the iron curtain. Hungary was one of those countries, but even beyond Soviet occupation, there was the occupation of the Ottoman Empire and the Habsburg Dynasty and the, the Austrian Empire and the German uh, Empire and most recently the Soviets. So this long history of occupation and oppression had its mark on the people, but the Lord Christ does not give up on us. And he was not giving up on the Hungarian people because in Hungary there is now an opportunity to share the hope of Christ. It happened largely when the government reached out to the churches asking for help, if you can imagine such a thing. And so they, they asked if the churches would help administer social services such <coughs> as public schools. And so the Baptist churches in the Baptist people in Hungary, less than 1% of the population, took responsibility for 49 public schools where they could pour into the community, into the teachers, into the students, the love of Christ. And so it's an opportunity that hasn't been there before to lift high the hope of Jesus. My wife Amanda teaches in one of those schools, and I work along with her the, with the union churches in areas of outreach, evangelism, church planting, and education. So we've been in Hungary for almost six years, and our first uh, year of, that we were there was spent like most missionaries in language training. Hungarian is a really tough language for English speakers to learn, um, possibly because of the grammar or the 14 vowel sounds, but we're not sure it's a tough one. But the Hungarians are very, very proud of this fact. In fact, there is a joke, and I'm gonna need your help with jokes because I'm not very good at them. Are you ready? Okay. Do you know what the language of heaven is going to be? Well, it's going to be? <laughs> okay, and do you know why? No. <laughs> because it's going to take all of eternity to learn. <laughs> We're working on it. John and I are able to do our work in Hungarian, but our 
grammar sometimes is a little bit funny, but we're getting there. We commit to keeping studying. Our kids, praise the Lord, are all fluent in studying in Hungarian. When we finished our Hungarian language year, uh, and we began to meet with our partners about discerning what the Lord wanted us to do, how would we help the Hungarian Baptist Union? Uh, we were a bit surprised when they wanted us to begin an English-speaking ministry. Actually, a little bit disappointed because uh, we just finished Hungarian, we wanted to do a Hungarian ministry. But we are good partners, and so we trusted their discernment. They wanted us to start an English Bible study on Monday night as an outreach event. I, you know, as a pastor for 18 years, I, I was a little suspect of that. I mean, I, I don't, I did a lot of Bible studies, but never did we really consider Bible study an outreach event. When you put a sign out there and it says, come to Bible study, you don't usually get tons and tons of non-Christians to come to that. So I was, I was curious to how this would work. And so we prayed, and then we prepared, and we promoted. In our first English Bible study, we had five people. And then two weeks later, we had six people. And then we got up to, to seven people. And this was the trend for a few months. But then some of our students graduated, and they moved to different places, and our numbers began to decline. And, and before long, we were three. Three people, and two of us are right here. <laughs> I started to feel discouraged. And I prayed, Lord, have you sent us to Hungary to do a Bible study for three people? And I prayed, Lord, is, and maybe you know this prayer. It's called the exit strategy prayer. Lord, is there something else? Lord, did I miss it? What should I do? And I kept praying the exit strategy prayer. And, and the Lord just kept saying, wait. And so we waited, and it wasn't very long. Before he sent a young couple, uh, they came to a Bible study, and they were so excited. Then they said, oh, we think there's so much potential. We want to be a part. Can we help? Can we meet more often? They said those things that church leaders long to hear. What can we do to help? And so we said, yes, yes, and yes. And so the next week we met, and they brought their friends. And then their friends brought their friends, and their friends brought their friends. And within a few months, we were meeting with 40 or 50 or 60 different people from all over the world. So that was almost four and a half years ago, five now, four and a half. And we're so grateful that the English Bible study remains a living, vibrant community. I love these, this picture because it shows faces from uh, five different continents. Uh, we still don't have anybody from Australia and no one from Antarctica yet, but we're praying the Lord will send them. But in the next slide, you can see some of the places that our students and um, people that were uh, coming to Bible study have come from. It's amazing to see how God keeps drawing people to the group. And here's a picture of just a few weeks before we left on our home assignment. And you may wonder, why are all of these people coming to a Bible study? But we think that, as it's been said already today, it's like the image of a candle. And if you take a candle and you take it into a bright place, you can see the candle and it shines. But if you take a candle and you put it into a dark room, and if you lift it up, that light spreads everywhere. And it's the most amazing thing. And Hungary can be a dark, lonely place, especially if you're a foreigner. The language of Hungarian and English are so far apart that it's very isolating. So our students can feel alone, they can feel isolated. But when they come to English Bible study, they find not just any community, but the community that is the body of Christ. And we lift up Jesus with an evangelical Bible study, and people from all different types of backgrounds are coming. Um, atheist or no, no type of church background at all, but also Muslims and Buddhists and Hindus, and they're hearing the truth of Jesus week after week. We praise the Lord that he's doing this amazing thing we never dreamed such a thing was possible. All throughout the ministry we've had in Hungary, we have really relied on Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It reminds us to trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. Um, over and over, we've just had to trust Him. We didn't know what was coming next. 
We couldn't see ahead more than, more than just a step right in front of us. And this was really apparent how God was working through all the circumstances, even in COVID-19. I know this happened the same way here for you. Just like here in Hungary, everything was shut down overnight. And there we were with all these people coming to Bible study and no way to reach them. So we were able to meet online right away. And the first week that we had Bible study, uh, we had, a, this isn't a picture from the first week, but a conglomeration of many weeks, but we had about 100 people come. And we thought, what are we going to do with all these people? We don't want them to just show up and leave and not get to have any connections. So we invited some of the young leaders to help us create breakout groups, which became small group ministry. And after the Bible study where we would talk about Jesus and how um, he can be Lord of our lives, then the next step would be a small group. And the, the Bible study, or small group leaders would lead a discussion and they would pray together. It was amazing how even though we were apart for so long, the Lord deepened those relationships so that when we were able to come back together, they were deeper and stronger, not only in their relationships with each other, but in their commitment to Jesus. In the summer of 21, we sensed that God was about to do something amazing with this community. So we began to meet together on Sundays, praying, first with a small group of people. We began praying, asking the Lord, what is it that he wanted to do? And we realized that he was wanting us to start a Sunday gathering, a Sunday worship service. And we realized then we had a problem. The problem is, where would we meet? Because the space we were using was occupied on Sunday by another church. And so it's not easy in Deverance and Hungary to find a, a place big enough for 30 or 40 people. And so we went to our partners and we shared with them the vision. And first of all, they were very excited because in our city, at the university, there are over 7,000 international students who speak English. And at this point, there was no church that spoke completely English. And so they were so excited to have an opportunity for a new church. And they said, we know a place where you can meet. And they began to talk about this location that I actually remember. Because I remember four years previous that when we first arrived in Hungary, the pastor took us to this, it looked like the building was falling down. And we went up these creaky steps and he showed us this attic space and it was kind of empty and there's the picture. And, and he said, I have a vision. Someday I, I can see that this will be a place for a church. I took a picture of it because I wanted to see what would happen. Well, they were talking about this place and it was ready for a church to meet. And so we met. This was the place. You can see it's the same, same structure. It's just completely different. This was actually a picture of our first Sunday together. And, and it just goes to show that God always has a space and a place for you. That in fact, even now, if you can't see it, he's preparing it. There is a place for you and your ministry in God's kingdom. He is preparing a place. The birth of a church is such a wonderful thing to be a part of, and we have just stood in awe of the Lord and all that he has done. But perhaps the most wonderful thing, too, is to see the change in people and the way that people's lives have been transformed through the power of Jesus Christ. So you remember Timmy and Donnie that helped us get started with the ministry with the English Bible study. Well, not long after the church started, they expressed their desire to be baptized and to give their lives fully to Jesus and walk with him completely. And so we were able to celebrate their baptism. Um, that was almost two years ago. And today, while we're standing here, they're getting ready for Monday Night Bible Study tomorrow because they, along with two other leaders, are now in charge of the ministry there. It's the most amazing thing. Um, here's a picture of the church family on a um, international Sunday, which isn't too hard for us to do. Um, everybody was dressing up in something that looked like their home culture. And here's another picture from just a few weeks before we left on our home assignment of the International Baptist Church of Debertson. Now, we don't understand all that God does. He's full of mystery and wonder, and we're so glad that we serve a God that is so big we can't even understand it. What was he doing? Why did he need a church to be born in October of 2021? Well, we don't know. 
but we do know that it was ready to respond in February of 2022. That's when the war began with Russia and Ukraine. And you can see in this picture that we're about an hour from the Ukrainian border. So pretty quickly after the war started, refugees began coming across the border by the thousands and no one expected this to happen. There was no structure in place. There was no one ready to receive them. And people were just running away from the war. And we um, think that maybe this was the prayer of many of the refugees in Psalm 27, verse 5. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. When the war broke out, thousands of refugees came, and this picture looked like um, most of the churches in our area. But when the churches reached capacity, they began to ask families if they would host refugees. And we, of course, volunteered. Now, I don't actually like to call them refugees because I, I would rather think of them as guests. See, I believe that God has sent them to us. And, and we began to receive guests from Ukraine. And there, there are so many stories, but, but here's a, a story that was so encouraging. The very first family that came, uh, they arrived late at night. And when they came, they were actually two families. And, and we found out the story. Why? It's because the, the fella in the middle holding the child, uh, his is a Christian family, and that's, his was our connection to the church, but when he was fleeing Ukraine, they met another family at the border, and this other family was not Christian. And so this family, this Christian family, wanted to share their faith in Jesus with another family. And so he said, hey, I've got a place to stay. You can come with us. Now, his place to stay was our house. We just didn't know it yet. <laughs> but we were so glad to receive all of them. And we were so encouraged that this man would have the mindfulness to share his faith, even as he's fleeing from uh, fleeing, fleeing Ukraine for his own lives with his family. We were so encouraged. Most of our guests only need to stay for one or two nights, but we did have one family that stayed with us for longer. Um, the family came to us um, after being in uh, the subway in Kyiv, uh, sheltering there, and then going to a, a few temporary shelters before finally the father of the family was forced to stay at the border. Um, most men between the ages of 18 and 60 were not allowed to leave Ukraine so that they could be uh, able to serve in the Ukrainian army. So the mom, uh, Ira, she's in the pink shirt, and her two children, Roma, who was 18 months, and Rosa, who was five, uh, came to stay with us. And uh, they, they came for a while because they wanted to move on to Western Ukraine. I'm uh, sorry, Western Europe. Most people do. But um, the kids had COVID, and they could not um, uh, go any further because they were sick and they needed to recover. So we got to take them to us. And over and over, God showed up, showing them, showing us hope. Um, our family really chipped in together to try to entertain uh, two little children. Even our, our little fuzzy dog, Pepper, was quite the helper. Um, we really think he's a super dog. But um, when the kids got a little bit healthier, um, they were able to go to church with us. And uh, the first Sunday that they came, uh, Rosa went to Sunday school. And in this picture, you can see her in Sunday school with Rami. He's a pharmacist from Egypt, and he speaks five languages. But he does not speak Russian, and he does not speak Ukrainian. So Sunday school was a pretty interesting affair that day. Um, but he was teaching about Jonah and the big fish. And that same day, just for one Sunday, there was a guest with us from Mukachevo, Ukraine. And she could speak Ukrainian and English, and she translated for the family in church. And afterwards, when Rosa heard she was in Mukachevo, she realized that that was the same place where her dad was staying. And she asked this woman if she could please take the picture that she colored in Sunday school and show it to her daddy. Now, Peter, Rosa's daddy, was a refugee. Where was he staying? Nobody knew. But we ran over the picture, and our friend took the, the picture back. And about a week later, we received this on Facebook. Peter did receive the picture that Rosa had painted. Isn't it amazing that God would give that glimmer of hope even in such a dark time? 
And you have to wonder if the connection was made because they're believers, they love the Lord. Could he see that Jonah was in the belly of the big fish safe, just like his little girl was safe with strangers? This family stayed uh, three months in Hungary and then uh, Ira and her children went back to Ukraine uh, to be reunited with Peter. And um, we were able a couple months ago to get across the border to see them in Ukraine. And they're doing very well together. Uh, they're all serving the church. And we were so encouraged to see how the Lord had used the difficult circumstances to draw them closer together and in service to, to his kingdom. Now, we believe God will take care of them. But we also believed that God would send more guests. And so, just like the Lord had prepared a place for the church, we felt the church should prepare a place for the next family. And so we, we rented a, a space in this, you can see on the right side there, a typical communist housing. If you've been to Eastern Europe, they all look like this. But, but inside, they're pretty nice. And so we found a space uh, in the church community. Our new church began working together for, to prepare the place. Uh, the next picture shows some of the ladies filling the cabinet with food and getting it ready. The next picture is of our Ecuadorian family preparing the bedroom. Uh, the next picture is of our Nigerian family and Lena from Indonesia and Elizabeth from Romania all working together to prepare the place for the family that the Lord would send. And the Lord did send a family. So this is the family that we are now supporting in this place. Her name is Mar Miriam, and she has four children, and uh, she is, you know, she's taken care of. And we believe for the long term, because we're partnering with another church, we're partnering with the Baptist Services in Hungary to provide not only a place for her to live, but also a job for her, and school for the kids, and spiritual care through the church. So we're thankful that through this, through our partnership together with these organizations and our partnership with you, that we are able to make a difference in the lives of this family. Uh, we saw the, the kids, they were posting, these kids, posting on Facebook a few weeks ago, and you know, sometimes like we do in America, but you know, kids accomplish something, we throw a picture on Facebook. Well, they had the kids uh, doing their graduation ceremonies and they were playing with their friends at school, and the thought occurred to me, that these children have the gift of childhood because they have a place in people who care about them. And I think, I think that's the joy of partnership, the joy of doing Christ's work together, uh, caring and helping families such as these. So we thank you for your financial support and your partnership. Uh, and we're always looking for new partners. Uh, could you say a quick word about that, Linda? Yes, um, we do thank you so much for your partnership. If you want to sign up to be on our prayer partner list, um, out in the lobby there's a yellow sheet. You can give us your name and your email. If you feel the Lord leading you to partner with us financially, we do invite you to do that as individuals. And you can do that. Um, there's a number on the back of our prayer card, or you can talk to us about how to sign up online. We're so, so thankful for you. Thank you for doing ministry in Hungary. Thank you for doing ministry with the Ukrainians. We, we praise the Lord for your partnership in the gospel. Our experiences in Hungary remind us of the story in the book of Acts of Philip and the Ethiopian. I think maybe you know that story. It's, it's a story that calls us to go and stay near. You know, the, the story it comes from Acts chapter 8. I'll read from verse 26. It says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of the treasury of the Kandik, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. And on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told him, Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot. He heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading, Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. 
He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb is silent before the shearer, he is silent. So he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very scripture passage and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here's water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. I like that story because it, it's a story of Philip just minding his own business. And then one day, an angel shows up and says, go south to the road, the desert road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now, whenever an angel shows up in your life, that's a pretty big deal. Uh, I mean, you see, we read about angels showing up in the Bible, and they usually say things like, do not be afraid. It's like this is basic training for angel and angel school in heaven. They're going to say these to the humans, or else they're just going to be too scared. They won't hear you. So, so the angel appears and gives a message to Philip that no doubt would have been challenging to hear. Because sometimes, the angel does have a hard message. It was true for Philip. He was supposed to, to go to Gaza. There were two roads that went in those days. One went east, I'm sorry, one went west, and it was easier, it was shorter, and one went south. It was longer and more difficult. And even more, the Greek word for the word south can actually also mean at midday. So really what it means is it was during the heat of the day the most difficult time of the day and the most difficult journey Philip was to travel. It, it would be like if the Holy Spirit came to us right now and said, I've got a mission for your church, your churches in Indianapolis this afternoon or this evening, but I want you to go by way of Chicago. <laughs> Who would ever do that? Nobody would do that. And no doubt, an unusual request, the longest route at the worst time of the day. No doubt, maybe Philip would have said that exit strategy prayer. Lord, is there another way? Are you sure? But thankfully, Philip was obedient. He starts out on this unusual journey trusting that God is already at work. Sometimes that's the hard part, isn't it? It's the go part, when the Lord says go, and you just can't see it all. But you, you know you have to go, you have to trust, you have to look, you have to wait to see how God is at work. You just have to go sometimes. This is an important scripture principle, actually. The idea of going into the world, going with the good news, going to share the truth of Jesus into our neighborhoods, our communities, and the world around us. This was true back then, and it's true now. Philip goes, and he sees an Ethiopian traveling in a chariot, and it's obvious that the Ethiopian is searching for something in his life. This is a spiritual moment. So while I was reading the book of Isaiah, he knows this is an important book, but he doesn't understand it. And then this is the point where the Holy Spirit, he tells Philip, he says, go to the chariot and stay near it. In other words, the Holy Spirit is telling Philip, be available. Just hang around the situation, get close, but be there long enough to see what I'm about to do. Sometimes that's the hardest part. Maybe it's not the going part, it's the staying near part, the waiting part, the being there long enough, the hanging around part. That's hard to do. It's almost funny if you imagine the situation, because Philip comes running up to the, the chariot, you know, he's just running along. How are you doing? You know, they kind of begin this conversation, and, and then he says, hey, do you understand what you're reading here? And the Ethiopian says, how can I, unless someone explains it to me? But the next thing he knows, he invites him up into the chariot, and he asks, who, who is the prophet talking about? 
That's the question, isn't it? Who? Philip knows because he's talking about the life and death of Jesus. It says in verse 32, he was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shear is silent, so he did not open his mouth. It was the perfect opportunity to share the good news of Jesus. Ethiopian believes and wants to have new life. And he says, hey, can we get baptized as soon as we find water? I love this because there's no lesson in discipleship here. There's no baptism classes, no, pro no membership program, not even a lesson in stewardship. They just find water and he's baptized. It's all about waiting and responding to the Holy Spirit. In verse 36, the Ethiopian says, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? In some versions of the Bible, Philip says, if you believe with all your heart, and Ethiopian replies, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. As soon as they get into the river, there's a baptism, and when it's over, Philip disappears. The story of Philip and the Ethiopian, I think, is an incredible story of evangelism because it's not about Philip's clever plan of outreach. It's not about his strategic outreach plan. It's only about his obedience and his willingness to listen to the Holy Spirit. Philip is asked to do an unusual thing. Travel the heat of the day, the worst time, the worst, the worst route. But yet in that request, God does the most amazing thing. And Philip is willing to respond because he is listening. Spirit. He is willing to see where God is at work. He is willing to take a risk to join him at work. So my question this morning, and I conclude with this, where is God at work around you? And how is he inviting you to join him? Now, I don't know the answer to the question. I don't know in what way God is inviting you. But I do know that he is. In whatever way that is, whatever and however he's asking you, you will find joy, you will see God at work if you join him and if you trust him. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for your call in our lives. Thank you for the joy of being about your mission, of doing your work in this place. Thank you that you call us and you invite us and thank you that you work in us and through us. Lord, we ask your blessings. Help us to have courage to follow and, and faith to trust you and, and patience to wait on your work. We thank you and we pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. That story also opens the door to a variety of other stories where in the, Luke tells us in the book of Acts, that God was going to send a man named Saul to a man named Ananias who was terrified of Saul. And because both of them listened to the Spirit, the work of God begins. And then there's a story of, in chapter 10 of the book of Acts is Peter and Cornelius. And uh, the ministry begins to the Gentile world because of Peter's vision and his willingness to listen to the Spirit. So thank you very much for inviting us and, and encouraging us to say we don't know how the Spirit's working, but we do believe that the Spirit is working. That is our common confession this morning. As we look to close today, we're going to uh, I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to do this a little old school, and uh, we're going to ask you to um, uh, pick up your hymnals. Uh, uh, those of you in the front pews, if you don't have a hymnal, somebody behind you will, will hand you one. But number 320, where is it that we place ourselves today, not only in the presence of the Spirit, but this song reminds us that it's beneath the cross of Jesus. It's at the feet of Jesus that we are called to be his people and to be sent to be his people in the world around us. Let us. Let us say that they need to cross <laughs>
before we are sent and we gather at uh, uh, the Lincoln Township Community Building in Fish Lake, correct? Right. Dave? Okay. Make sure I have my facts straight. <laughs> so we want to invite you to come and eat and to dine. What better way than breaking bread together and discovering what the Lord is doing? But before we do that, we're going to ask the good family to come up. I'm going to ask Bethany to come up. And I'm going to ask wherever you are, we are going to um, lay hands on you and anoint your ministry here for this year. Uh, because this year is, we'd like to say it's a break, but it really isn't. It's just a different pattern of life, isn't it? Yeah. So, but we want the Lord, I, you, we may, you may have seen the graphic, 86%. We, as we continue to partner, want to pray that God makes that 100%. Uh, to, to further ratify the ministry. So I'll have you come up and um, maybe Brother Dave, if you'd come up as well. And then I'm going to ask uh, Bethany. Bethany, uh, for many of you, you, uh, you know that Bethany and her family spent the, uh, her first 18 years of life, many more years for her parents, but in Pakistan, ministering to the people there and so I'm going to ask her to just lead us in prayer um, this morning. And if you just reach out, we don't do this very often, but if you just reach out where you are um, as we anoint them in prayer this morning. Lord, we thank you for the good family. Thank you for calling them into ministry. Thank you for the people of Hungary that you love more than we could ever imagine. Lord, we pray for them during this year of home assignment. You know it's not a break. <laughs> um, but Lord, we pray that you would um, just anoint their ministry, anoint this time. Of, uh, we pray that you would give them refreshment, uh, that you would encourage them in the places that they go and the people that they meet. Lord, we ask that you would bring in the full amount that they need for their continued support. Bless their family members who are uh, in Illinois and in Hungary. As they are separated during this time, they will just continue to bless and encourage their hearts and help them to continue to see fruit from their, uh, their ministry there in Hungary. And they would just encourage them throughout this time and bring great blessing uh, that they can see the way that you're working. Encourage their hearts when they get discouraged. Uh, just uh, really lay your hand upon them. That they might always see and know that even when they can't understand what you're doing, that you are uh, preparing them and that you are bringing a uh, new, new ministry to them and whatever that you have for them, that you would just continue to bless and encourage them. Lord, we ask now that as we continue from here, uh, that you will bless our time of fellowship together over our meal. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And we are reminded that we are sent because of the grace, the mercy, and love and forgiveness of God the Father. We are sent under his power through the work of Jesus Christ, his Son, and in the power of the Spirit, till we gather again and proclaim his name together. Go in his grace and mercy and join us for lunch. <laughs>